like I have a hook up here. And so this basket was hung and I was sitting here and I would just weave around, weave around, weave around. It would take me like two and a half hours to go around when I was working on the decoration. So I had some, you know, up to 11 hour days, you know, because if you wet the grass and dry it and wet it and dry it, dry it and wet it and dry it, it loses its, its natural waxes that are in there and it gets dried out, it darkens. So if I decided to weave, I would dampen the grass and then I would have to weave as much as I could. And it took me about a month, the whole month, to do it. It was quite a feat. My name is Coral Chernoff. I'm a basket weaver, skin sewer, and I like to gather all my materials, process them, and, and make things with them. A group of us basket weavers, Alutic basket weavers from Kodiak Island, um, had an opportunity to go to two museums in St. Petersburg, Russia, and look at their collection of baskets. With a Museum of Anthropology and Ethnography and the Russian Ethnographic Museum, there's two different museums that have collections. They have the earliest collection of baskets, both grass, spruce root, uh, from Kodiak in the world. I'm Elizabeth Peterson. I was born and raised on Kodiak Island. I've lived here in Anchorage now for the last uh, nine years. When they brought out the baskets that were stored in boxes, when they start taking them out of each other, it was, oh my goodness, look at all those beautiful baskets. Being held for a hundred years or so, they were in such great shape still. They were just beautiful. Up until then, we see a few baskets here and there. We see a few in the Braunoff collection. We see a few in books, but we've never seen that quantity. What's wonderful is, is the weavers were looking at the baskets. They were able to share with the curators their knowledge about what the baskets were made of, um, how they were made, and start to literally weave in more stories of what the baskets mean to, to us than just an ethnographic piece. After I came back from St. Petersburg and visiting the May Museum over there, I came back with newer ideas, you know, for weaving grass socks. I okay. You might. Yeah. <laughs> My name is June Simeonov Pardue, and I'm a basket weaver. I skin sew and do a lot of beadwork and paint as well. I would say that these little socks that, that are made for children would have been people who are traveling, maybe from another village to another. This is, like you say, a moisture barrier. First, you have a, you're either a rabbit or a sea otter liner, uh. and then you put the sock the grass sock over it and then you slip your foot into the boot. So can you just imagine men going out in their kayaks and oh. needing to keep their feet warm? Yes. Yeah. So Absolutely. I'll bet you they had more than one pair, you know, because uh, I can remember as a child having to take mine off my feet and they would have to dry them before we could use them again. So I imagine men traveling had a couple of pair of these. Having access to the collections to be able to understand them is extremely important for us to, to look at and compare with the archaeological collections, compare with ethnographic collections, and then compare with what artisans, mainly women, are doing today. I want to know what they used for color and when I got one up close I looked at it and I was amazed that it was just yarn and the colors were just bright and beautiful as if they were just made yesterday. In a book you can't look inside and underneath and you know, the front side of the stitch and the back side of the stitch. So to be able to see all that, you get the whole picture. The, oh my God, look at that. Or look at the mats and look at how many they had. And look at the baskets and the size difference. You know, from baskets that are, you know, this big to baskets that are that big. And to, to watch them is, is wonderful. The quality of the workmanship was it's just unreal, just un unbelievable. That was pretty inspiring, I thought. Well, I'm gonna have to come back and not be so lazy, you know, and just really put something else 
you know, into my basket. I can tell you how many days after I got back, I started. It was about two days after I got back um, from Russia, I started on this basket. I mean, the whole idea behind the project, again, is to bring the information home, to share it with the community so that uh, we learn from our ancestors what they made, how we add to what the weavers already knew, and then we pass that on. And these are all the, the details that I wanted to put in. I wanted it to be very large. I wanted to use this technique of decoration. I had not ever used that before. And so I saw that on several baskets that were there. And the wonderful thing, like when you get to interview Coral, is um, she likes to do stuff that is not just for sale, but to have a functional use in her life. And I think that'll start to carry over into the students she inspires. But I, I wanted to put this handle. This basket is made, you know, to hold things. And so if you put the handle just on the top, you know, there's two, just all the stresses on those two areas. So I wanted to put this handle going underneath. And then several baskets had um, this where the braid ended, this little stitch and it looked really decorative it looked really pretty so I wanted to put that on my basket but what really stood out to me was that each time that they wove a stitch one of these strands was also twisted was for added for, strength for strength and maybe durability yes could you tell mm -hmm, okay mm -hmm. yeah that's what I think it was you know so it, I wasn't just twisting my twining weavers but I was t twisting each piece of grass that I handled you know, and so I'm going to be sure to do that every time I weave uh, the grass socks, like I did in this one right here. Did that add a lot of time to what you were? It added more time. Yeah, it takes time to twist each strand that you're working with. The basket I saw in Russia was maybe about this big around, about the size of a coffee can. Going to have the pretty little dots all around it with the open weave in it. I just decide to do a smaller version of it. I'd have a wet cloth by me to keep the grass damp because when it it's not damp it tends to dry out and gets brittle and breaks so you always have to keep this damp all the time and then just start doing the weaving and incorporate the colors into it and sometimes I can weave without watching as long as I know where I'm at but my mom tried to teach me when I was young, a young girl, when I was 13, 14. I tried a couple of weaves and I said, this is not not what I wanted to do. So I never got back into it, never got interested in it. And then I, a couple of years ago, I realized that, wow, nobody back home does any more basket weaving. The artist died off back home. So when the class came up at the Heritage Center, I got her a scholarship from the Cognac Education Foundation and went and take the class and I was so glad I did just to keep the tradition going. Because this is a larger pair, mm -hmm. I had to work my decreases right here and also right here. I had to draw it in is what I had oh, to do wonderful. and then pull it in along in here as well. A lot of it is, is by um, uh, trial and error. The first pair that I tried were oh, just I so misshapen. you had to redo them a few times and <sighs> they go were back. So, and they were so misshapen, you know, that I had, and by the time I got done practicing on those, they weren't worth even keeping, so they're tacked on a wall at home. That's great. As a reminder for me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't make things, I don't visualize the end product, I just, pick up what I'm gonna do. And like this, I knew I was doing a big basket, but sort of the grass dictated what it was doing. And I feel like if it's not quiet and not listening, you know, then I end up like struggling with the grass, trying to get it to do what I want it to do when it wants to do something else. So that's how I feel like I just like shape stuff into whatever it wants to be shaped into. So I sort of need that quiet to sort of get that from it. A little first little basket and they incorporated the colors and you could tell in the bottom part as I was you know just 
learning that it was all sloppy. Then it got neater as I got to the end of it after I got the hang of it. But yeah, it's just my little first little basket. It's all on the curing, so I really recommend it. Sometimes that takes a season or two to catch on to that, but it's worth it. I would recommend that they learn to cure their own grass because that's part of it. If you're out there cutting and curing it and you see how pliable it is and, and you dry it, keep it clean and soft. If you don't take care of it, you get very dry, brittle grass. So we do harvest the grasses in the summertime and that's when I, I actually did grow my greatest appreciation for the art of basket weaving was when I actually started doing the collecting myself because you can go out and you can harvest just huge bundles of grass, the bee try, and you'll only end up with about that much of finished product. You get a bundle, she said, get as big around as your waist. Well, some of us had bigger waist than she did because <laughs> she only stood about this tall. <laughs> Mrs. Shaftnikov. Gathering the grass is relaxing. Well it gets you outside you know in the winter we have such you know cold wet winters that in the summer it gives you something to do you go to the beach and you cut some grass and you have a picnic and then you take it home and you wrap it. Now it takes around three weeks to cure your grass. You have to take care of it during the curing process and drying and afterwards you have to take care of it to make sure that it doesn't get mildew and doesn't break and you don't dry the grass you cure it. Once it cures, you have to take it apart and split it. You have to take the outer blades off. You have to get the inner blades hung right away to dry, and sometimes that alone will take a week or so. Usually the two outer leaves you discard, and then the inner ones you use for your spokes, and then the very inner part, which are the weavers, she considered to be the most valuable, and clear back then she said they're worth a dollar a piece <laughs> because of all the work. These first blades are so soft already that I can just, you know, start twisting them and, and probably weaving with them without even really dampening them. For the grass socks, I go out in the fall to pick the grass after nature has cured it. It's already turned to this beautiful wheat color. And when I take my grass apart, there's what I call a mama grass and a baby grass. Aha, this one has it. And that's what I really like to use because the, the baby inside the mama is the softest and the silkiest that you can find. And this is what I like to use for my weavers. I've gotten a lot of my grass out of Old Harbor. I've gotten a lot out of Port Lyons this last year. And previously, when I lived in Anchorage, I would just go to the Native Hospital and I would buy grass, or at AFN, the Alaska Federation of Natives Convention, they have vendors, and I would purchase my grass since I wasn't on the island. For me, it's mostly the fiber anyway. I love the fiber. I'm not sure I love the monotony of weaving sometimes, but I do love gathering and curing, and that's a good, that's a process. That's a three or four month process sometimes. Those bundles that you buy for $125, some people will just thought it was outrageous. You're buying a bundle of grass for $125, but like I know what that person had to go through to get that bundle so you do pay the price. About you know your grass and your front yard dies every year. This is 500 years old. It's pretty amazing that it's still here. My name is Marnie Leist and I'm the registrar at the Aleutic Museum and Archaeological Repository in Kodiak, Alaska and right now I am in the collections room deep inside the museum and we are standing next to the Carlick One collection. Carlick One is a very special collection and it's special because it has organic preservation. Um, basically if you put a piece of wood in the ground and come back 500 years from now nothing's going to be there. But this site is special, it was right near the Carlick River and there was a lake above the site. The lake was draining into the site and it preserved everything in the water, kind of airtight environment. If you've heard the theory like things don't rot in a bog, it's the same principle. So in this collection we have all kinds of organic materials such as spruce root basketry, wood, all kinds of organic materials that normally simply just would not exist otherwise. So here's the parallel lines and then this wavy pattern is 
the warm woods trail you know because it's been folded up um, little pieces fell out and some pieces of burnt wood charcoal fall out so you can tell that this was uh, probably used for cooking and I think this object is really typically elutic. It's a banya scoop, you know, like the sauna bath. And of course it has, you know, the effigy on the end. And when it's split, someone took the time to repair it. So you'll find a lot of reuse in objects. You'll find a kayak paddle that was turned into a skin stretching board that was used as a cutting board that was used as a rock tong. Because you're making the tools to make the tools. You know, there was no metal, as you mentioned before, you know, the Russians came. So your um, carving tools are teeth. You know, you're making the tools to make the tools. I don't know which way it looks best. I have just a few birch bark containers. And this is a, a fragment. So the birch and then the spruce root tied. The spruce root basketry, people used to say it came from the Tlingits, only Tlingits made the basketry, but because we have the raw material, you know, we have the pieces split, we have woven pieces in process, we can definitely say for sure that people in Carlick were making spruce root basketry. You know, people were trading, they were traveling. So I think, you know, not only materials were being traded, but knowledge. Archaeologists went there, did some testing in 1983 from Bryn Mawr College, and then came back in 84, 1985, did a large excavation in 1987 and then in 1994 the entire Carlick River shifted and the site just started eroding out into the ocean. Um, so there was another two excavations in 94 and 95 and um, the site is totally gone now. If uh, the archaeologists probably would have kept excavating from 1987 to 1994 this entire room would be Carlick 1 and the site just is gone. It's totally gone. It eroded out into the ocean. So not only do we have the excavated materials but we have all the beach vines. I mean, it's washing out into the ocean and it's washing back up onto the beach. So all the Carlick residents were picking up pieces and then turning them into the museum. So it's an almost complete spruce root basket. I had to come up with, uh, you know, we try to keep everything in microclimates to help preserve it. Uh, so I had to come up with, you know, some interesting storage. So you could kind of see it still, but, you know, give it support and, keep it in a nice, stable environment. Kodiak, in my mind, is just one big archeological site and there's just a wealth of information available. And that's why we're lucky to have the museum here and we're lucky to have Patrick on staff and Sven here be able to do archeology span here and to be able to share the information here and keep the collections here. That wasn't typical. Archeology span used to be done by you know, university professors. They come here, they dig a village, and then they go away. You know, this material was stored at Bremar College, it was stored at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Finally, when the Lutic Culture Center and then subsequently the Lutic Museum was founded, the materials are able to stay in Kodiak for the Kodiak community. We'll come over yes. and you do the same thing. And from the first lesson, I learned exactly why baskets that are the size of a a bobbin of thread will cost hundreds of dollars. This <laughs> is difficult. Basket weaving is something that you either like or you don't like or you have the patience for or you don't. You're going to take it over the bottom one and you're going to swap these two. So up and down. And of the 12 in our class, I was the only one that actually stuck it out and finished. And I think that it was because of the elder interaction and I had a close connection with them um, outside of school. Pick up the next one. Grass basket weaving is, is our oldest and longest running program here. And it was really very fortuitous timing at the same time that the Kodiak Historical Society was incorporating as a nonprofit with a mission to collect and preserve cultural traditions of, of Kodiak, there was a lady, Anfisa Shapsnikov, who was from Atka, then lived in Alaska, and was a, an expert basket weaver. Eunice Neseth visited with Anfisa and observed her weaving baskets and asked her if she'd be interested in teaching the art form. 
and she agreed. And for the next 20 years, Anfisia led 10 classes of basket weaving, teaching the art form that she had learned as a young woman by her maternal aunt. This is a basket of Anfisias with the floral and scroll work. She describes that Anfisia would graph out her designs on graph paper, often modeled after work that she saw in embroidery books, but that she would also make her own designs. Her writings record that there was a wide variety of students, that there were women from the Coast Guard base who were interested in learning. Perhaps the audience that they targeted most were young Native women that they wanted to pass the craft on to, believing that they would maintain a linkage with Kodiak and be good potential teachers to pass the art form on. There were basket weavers in Old Harbor and Akiak that were weaving and teaching um, their family members at the same time that Anfisia and Eunice were teaching here in Kodiak. And one of the most prolific and productive is Fedosia Inga, and we're lucky to have a number of her baskets. This basket is one of my favorite pieces, both because of its size, it's quite large, and the incorporation of beadwork, which Fedosia did a lot of. And I also really like the interior. This piece was made in the 1950s, and I just like this incorporation of this whimsical lining. Fedosia Inga was a very skilled weaver and a teacher. For example, June Simeonov Pardu learned from Fedosia, and June is herself an incredibly accomplished weaver and now a teacher. Maya is my mom's the best weaver um, and the best teacher, too. I'm really fortunate to to have her because she's always learning, which means when I go to her house, I'm always learning. This one is weave one, skip one, and and weave over for the turning stitch. And with that one, it's, you know, there's no, there are no words to describe how you do a turning stitch. You have to learn through observation. So it's hands-on teaching. Um, so it's a legacy that continues and you can trace from student to teacher to new students. So now you're taking out some of what I did. Yes. Because it just, just was too far apart. Too far apart. Hmm. I thought it would be fairly easy because I am a craft person, but it wasn't. <laughs> I was ready to quit on the third class. I thought if I cannot catch on, I, that's it, you know, but I was able to catch on. I don't know, I finally clicked at the third class. But after I started teaching myself, I noticed it did take people about three classes before they connect with it and they see what's happening. So, so I was normal. <laughs> Arlene was a student of Eunice here at the museum, I believe just in the kitchen next door to where we are now, they learned. Before the end of the first semester, she was having health problems, so she had to stop. So I went home and that's when I read the book for two years and I practiced and I cut grass and I almost cried. And <laughs> so at the end of that time, I went back to her after two years and she was pleased with what I had done, so she asked if I would like to be her helper. And Arlene, of course, is a, a master weaver. Her baskets are just exemplary and so well done. And she's taught her daughters as well as a number of students through the Kodiak College. I, well, I just wanted it to flow more like the water or the yeah, water, the ocean, you know, when it comes in the waves. I wanted to give that movement. And then I corded the top just so that I could add the little beads and again, not finish it off tight. I wanted the whole thing to kind of flow. I deliberately allowed the bottom to, to um, wave, and that's by adding, adding extra spokes. She has a reputation as being so skilled that when she does offer classes through the college, people flock to them. Every second Saturday, we try to do a different kids activity at the museum. Basically, I gotta try to come up with something relevant that's fun with the time of the year and our culture and try to find innovative ways to get kids interested in learning about the Luta culture and its people. I think Eunice and Anfisia and Fedosia Inga and all the women who taught um, younger generations of basket weaving would be really pleased to see the continuation of the program here and also the work of the Alutic Museum to take basket weaving out to the villages and to reunite skilled weavers of today with the pieces from the early 19th century that are in the museums overseas. That's also an important part of the evolution of the art form. Okay. Very nice.
That one looks so pretty with that gold on the frame. It really makes that grass. They keep coming back and want to keep learning more usually. So, um, which is, I'm a Luthic heritage and I'm still, every day I'm learning something new. Mm -hmm.